So uh, I'm Kerry Garrison with Multicopter Warehouse here in Centennial, Colorado. And with me is a good friend of mine, Vic Moss. So Vic, why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself for those who don't know who you are? Awesome. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me. This will be fun. Um, I'm a drone pilot here in, here in Colorado as well. Um, Carrie is my go-to guy when I need when he needs stuff, either repaired or or bought. Um, so definitely, if you're going to do it, go to Multicopter. But um, like I said, I'm a drone pilot here in Colorado. I've uh, been flying drones commercially since 2014, and I've been a photographer here in Colorado since 1988. So been here a long time. Um, most of you probably know me via the uh, Facebook organiz or for Facebook rooms uh, and the Facebook groups that I'm part of. I uh, do a lot of work in there and um, also work as an FAA safety team member. So volunteer doing that as a drone pro. So I help people educate themselves about drone rules, um, talk to them when they've been bad little boys and girls occasionally, and um, help the cities and things like that when they're trying to craft drone, drone rules. And the uh, latest and greatest thing we've done is uh, Kenji Sugahara and I launched Drone Service Provider Alliance last week. And it's been uh, so far a rousing success. We've had a lot of people really happy we're doing what we're doing. And um, we can talk about that here in a little while. Okay. And what, what are some of the things that you're doing with uh, the FAA? Um, well, like I mentioned, I was, I'm, I'm, I'm what's called a drone pro, which is a FAST team. Uh, FAST team is FAA safety team member. And we are on the FAST team that are drone specific people. There are, I think, 100, uh, I think there's over 100 of us now in the country. And uh, we just do things like we go to educate people. Um, we worked with the uh, city of Thornton and uh, tried to get their drone rules set up. And then they invited us as a as an FAA safety team tent uh, in their in their Thornton days. So that was kind of fun. We could have people come up and talk to us about drone rules and talk to the police department there and all kinds of different people come up and talk to us about different drone rules. And we've got little stickers and fun stuff like that. But mostly it's about drone education and helping people fly safe and helping them learn how to fly safe when they do something they didn't shouldn't have done yeah we've been doing that for quite a while when we first had been. the senator here who wanted to put transponders on every toy drone and all that <laughs> fun stuff so um you know vic and i go way back and if if there's been an issue with a state or a county or something that has tried to pass some uh drone rules vic has been uh, right there on the forefront uh throughout the country helping people to uh you know work with their local governments to to keep these stupid rules from getting put in place and to, to help them understand what they can and cannot actually enforce so uh a big heartfelt thank you vic for all the hard work that you've done i wish i've been able to do more but you've really been uh you know a, a leader and an inspiration to a lot of people on that front well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's there's there's so many people out there doing so many great things right now for the industry, um, and and it's um, it's fun to be part of that. So there's a lot of interesting things happening right now, and <laughs> some stuff that we see coming, right? Right. And right. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's just endless. But it's Where actually been started, an right? exciting time, right? So there's a lot of questions that have come up, and we've seen them in the the forums and some speculation on some of the new uh, changes to existing rules that we expect are gonna come. And they probably will come just a, a matter of time, but let's, I wanna hear your take on like the, the daylight waiver and what does is, what is the changes look like that, that you see coming down the road and how is that going to affect people? Okay, this is probably a good time to my, do my usual disclaimer since I'm part of the FAST team. Um, the views expressed herein are not necessarily those of the FAA. So, okay, we got that out of the way. Um, I have no inside information um, as much as I would love to, and boy, have I tried. I've, I, there's one person in particular that probably is tired of, you know, he sees an email come from me. It's like, oh, crap. But um, good guy anyway, he, but he just can't say anything to me. So everything I'm going to talk about is pure speculation of nothing inside information. Um, but with the new daylight rules, the, supposedly they're going to do away with 1029 or 10729, which is the daylight waiver that allows us to fly commercial ops at night. And it's going to be part of the 107 test. So when you go to get your initial 107, that's going to be part of the rules. You know, hey, you don't need a waiver because as you take this test, you go, oh, I know how to fly at night. That's fine. The FAA says you're good. Go for it. 
Um, that's come about because there's really, really never been any problems with people flying at night, um, as long as they, you know, as long as you're not flying in LA in front of a police helicopter. But um, the, for the most part, the FAA says, hey, you know what? They get it. They understand. We really don't need this waiver anymore. It's unnecessary paperwork. So it's really nice to be able to see that. How that is going to be incorporated into the current the current way it goes, I'm not sure. My best guess is that um, new people taking the uh, 107, so taking your initial test or your UGR, so your unmanned ground recurrent test, once these new rules come into effect, will automatically then take. Um, you know, you'll automatically have the ability to fly at night without a waiver. For those of us who have given, waivers, given that you adhere to certain rules, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not just you know willy nilly. Hey, I'm going to fly at night. Yay! There will be some rules, just like there are when, on your waiver. I'm sure it's going to be, um, you know, you're going to have to have the three mile strobes. Um, you're going to have to be, you know, be able to do a daylight scout if at all possible. You're going to have to, you know, VOs, the whole nine yards. Like the rules are now for your waivers, but since they're waived, they're not really rules per se, except individually on each waiver. Um, but what I'm going to assume is those of us who do have the waivers, we'll just, you know, we just keep flying. It's fine. Our waivers are four years long. Um, so until we either take a UGR or, you know, somebody on your team takes an initial uh, 107 test, then you'll just use your waiver. How it's going to work, and, and maybe they're going to have something where, you know, you go onto the uh, FAA safety team dot, dot gov and you take a particular part of the 107 test and then you can fly that way. I don't know how it's going to work. That's all speculation, but we'll know soon enough. Yeah. Um, do you think that's going to get tied into Lance for doing night that, flight? I hope so. Um, otherwise, it would be ideal, of course. It would be ideal. Um, that is going to be up to the individual airports, I would assume, because they are the ones that control the, the UAS FMs, the unmanned air, uh, unmanned, oh, I've said it so long, I don't know what it stands for, unmanned aircraft <laughs> facility maps, unmanned system, unmanned aircraft system facility maps, the, the, the grid maps is what everybody calls them. Um, Lance is not tied there yet, so maybe that's part of it. I do know from talking with FAA people that they can't just piecemeal these rules out because they're so intertwined, they're just gonna have to do a big rule vomit and do it all at once because they're all intertwined. The 44809 rules, the um, you know flying under a CBO and, and, and the test that hobbyists are gonna have to take, that's all part of the same big pile of rules coming down the pipe. Uh, uh, Roseanne is asking, is there any advantage to jumping through the hoops and getting a daylight waiver now? And I, I would say, um, my I'll say opinion yes. would be yes. I know people right? who are getting them right now. I've helped a couple people getting them. Um, they're last I heard, they're about three or four weeks out in approving them. They're not. They're not the five or six days anymore. And I'm sure COVID has a ton to do with that. Um, so if you go through, and they're not that many hoops to jump through. They're really not. You and I have done so many of these classes together that um, it, it's it's simple to do if you just follow the steps and follow the rules and the new drone zone actually is really, really good. I really do I do really like the new drone zone layout. Now, if you apply for it and you don't have it yet before the new rules come out, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to dump all of those? Or are they just going to say, well, you've got two years till UGR, so here's your waiver and it's good till you're no longer current. I mean, whatever your currency is. So again, total speculation. Is it worth doing it right now? Absolutely, 100%. I believe. Because we don't know when the change is going to come. We don't know when exactly, but I would bet almost my bottom dollar that it's sometime this month. Now, that's when they're announced. When will they take place? That's, that's to be determined. Right. So, um, in fact, if you go on our YouTube channel at Multicopter Warehouse, there's a webinar on doing your daylight waiver. It's pretty simple. And I, I think part of the, the move to this um, kind of a waiverless um, methodology is because you can pretty much copy and paste it and there's really not much to do. I mean, it, it is the most common requested waiver and it's the most yep. commonly approved waiver. Yep. It's mm -hmm. also the most commonly rejected waiver. <laughs> so, but, well, that's just know. because of pure numbers. I've yeah. seen some of those. You and I both have seen some of those. The waiver, the yeah. waiver, don't, don't just say, I will fly safely at night as your waiver. That is not gonna work. That's not and gonna people work. People do that. <laughs> uh, Robert's asking, what is a UGR? Oh, sorry, unmanned ground recurrent. 
I speak, I speak in FAA speak sometimes. I apologize for that. So throw something at me if I'm, well, you can't because you're not my robot. Yeah, unmanned ground recurrent is, this, is the one you take after your initial. So your initial 107 never expires, ever. You have it till you die. Um, what happens is you have to become, you have to redo the currency every two years. And it's not every two years, it's 24 calendar months from your test date. So if you do October 30th or October 15th of 2020, then you have to take it by midnight on October 31st of 2022. Yeah, um, let's see. Would those who already have their remote pilot certification be grandfathered in? Uh, we don't know, right? We don't know. Um, my best guess is that it will be part of your UGR. Um, or they do, you know, maybe the FAA is being really proactive and they're going to put a 10729 type test on FAA safety.gov, which everybody really should have an account for. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to hammer that home. Is so that FAA's, a different account than FAA drone zone? Yes. Um, although shoot, it might be, you can use the same name and password. I can't remember, but FAA safety.gov, you have to change your password all the time. So that's kind of a pain in the butt. But um, it's 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 where a lot of manned aviation go to take their their recurrent tests and that kind of thing, um, which is well we won't go there. But yeah, that's it's FAAsafety.gov is a really good and plus you can get really great information there. There's all kinds of stuff, um, classes and and seminar uh, webinars and um, things like that that will help you understand more to fly safe. Okay, um, the Rose, you're you're asking about. Uh, you thought you needed a minimum of four lessons with an authorized instructor. Well, there's no such thing. No, absolutely as no such an thing. An authorized instructor, yep. and there there's no rule for that. So um, now, in the daylight waiver, what some agencies and some companies have done is said that their pilots must go through some form of training with one of their instructors. Yeah, that yeah. that's completely valid to say. You know, mm -hmm. but there's no, there's no such thing as an authorized drone instructor or an FAA authorized yeah. instructor. There is a company out there that's that I don't think they still do because I think they got in trouble. But they 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 advertise themselves as an as an FAA drone instructor. It's like that doesn't exist. So, um, I wish it was. It'd be great. What what you know what what you have is a um um oh shoot was it a certified a CFI a certified flight instructor who works with the manned aviation side of things. I would love to see a certified drone instructor, CDI. So would I. The FAA. I'd like, uh, I'd, I, 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 I know who would get number one, <laughs> license number one, but I would like number two. I'm sure our friend okay. in the NTSB would be number one. <laughs> All right, lots of questions, guys. And uh -huh. a lot of this stuff is already on our agenda for today. So so bear with us. We're going to try and, and get through stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think probably the most relevant one here is what about flying over people? That is... Boy, that we have no idea on that. Um, I've heard both uh, that it's going to be, and again, speculation. No one said information. I've heard that you're going to require a um, one of the uh, one of the already uh, accepted um, parachutes. So at this point, that'd be para zero. Um, possibly the indemnity systems. Um, they're Maybe having a little more trouble. Yep. Um, so. That is 100% pure speculation, and it might just be, hey, you know what, you, you got a mini, go for it. You know, put 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 guards on it and don't kill anybody. I mean, it could be that simple, but I I doubt it. So no, nothing. The reality is, it sh it should be because <laughs> you know I and I, I I don't know if you remember this, but I I actually applied for a, a flight over going, way, yeah. a flight over people, and I had all the math, I had safety studies. I had university reports about uh, impact damage, <laughs> at, you know, all all this stuff to prove that a a DJI Spark at 50 feet would not kill you, and or even hurt you. They didn't even reply to it. Yeah, so, yeah, and that was back in the, in the earlier days too, if I remember correctly. What about two, almost three years ago, right when the Spark came out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Uh, I don't know why they didn't at least reply to it, but there's been a lot of changes in the waiver office as well. Ta one of the tasks, actually, the uh, DAC task group I was on worked on that aspect of it. So, um, yeah, it's 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 changed a lot, but it was certainly it's frustrating now, but it was a lot more frustrating in the beginning. Yeah, um, well, that's an interesting one. I mean, we'll jump around here a little bit. Sure, absolutely. As I'm, looking at stuff. I'm free for them. But uh, 
Scott's asking about when will Colorado quit trying to restrict drone flying in the airspace above state parks? And they don't. To my knowledge, they don't. No, they don't. Um, absolutely don't. And and to, and you've worked on this as well. But state parks are actually pretty cool about. And individual rangers are going to be kind of twerpy about it. But um, state parks understand that they can't control the airspace. Absolutely, one hundred percent, they can control. You know what you do what on, on the property. ground. And we would, you know, you and I have tried to work on that very unsuccessfully. Um, right, because so the, the, the rule in Colorado, the Colorado State Parks rule is you cannot have any airborne objects with the exception of a frisbee. So you cannot <laughs> play catch, you can't play football, you can't have a kite, you you can't skip rocks. That's actually specified oh, wow. in there. Um, wow. But so you cannot have any airborne object in a state park with the exception of a frisbee. So that covers drone flying in state uh -huh. parks. And because this is such a generic uh, agnostic, you know, rule, I don't see this changing anytime soon. No, now, no it would have to be specifically excluded from the rule. And I don't see that happening. You're right. I, I don't see it. I, I do know people who have gone to state parks and talked to a ranger and said, can I get an aerial photograph? And they go, sure, go ahead. You know, Oh, that's cool. Don't expect it. Do yeah. not expect yeah. that. That's you know? the rule. I that's have tried. Much. It's never happened for me. So, um, I've got a similar situation here in Jeffco um, that they have a rule that you can't fly over their open space. And I've gone round a bin or not round yeah. a bin, but I've gone round and round twice with one of their attorneys. And it's the point now, I was going to do it this summer, but COVID shut all that down. I'm going to let them know when I'm going to be flying and have them have them cite me. Yeah, I'll uh, be there. Yeah, and, and we'll just fight it that way. Because I just told them, yeah. I said, we can do this in person or we can do this in court, your choice. And they're just adamant that, nope, we're allowed. It's like, okay, let's play ball. Okay, good. Go for it. Uh, Lowell's asking, do other states restrict drone flights in state parks? And the most short answer to that is, well, most most certainly. Um, the best, actually, is Utah. Uh, yep. Uh, many of their state parks have drone season. Mm -hmm. And you can go, and I think it's, what is it, five or ten bucks it's, for a permit? Yeah, something really, sim yeah, really, really small. Something I'd pay. Yeah. And it, it's a good chunk of the year, too. It's like mm -hmm. October through May or something. Yeah, um, that's pretty nice so, in October. Yeah, most of most states that I almost every state that I know of has rules about it for their state parks. Utah being uh, probably the coolest that I'm aware of. Right. Uh, let's let's bounce back up here. Okay, where are we at with remote ID? Let's just okay. Get remote ID. <laughs> now the questions are going to roll. Um, again, <laughs> express views expressed are not those of the FAA. Um, I'm I'm. I've talked about this a couple different times, actually twice today now on different different um, webinars, but I'm an optimist by nature. And so I honestly think that the rules as they come out are not going to be anything close to what the NPRM was. 100% um, speculation on my my part. And uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm being a little Pollyannic, but um, I, I don't think it's going to be that bad. I hope it's not going to be that bad. Um, there are people inside the FAA that 100% agree with all the complaints we had, but the issue is going to be getting the alphabet agencies, the DHS, FAA, the SS, uh, not the FAA, sorry, the FBI, SS, um, uh, DOI, um, to not be so quick to do what they want to do, because those are the agencies that don't really understand what's going to happen to the industry. Um, if this hap if this goes through as the NPRM stated it. And I'm really, really hoping the FAA was able to convince those folks. Well, one of the problems with the NPRM was simply technology. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, regardless of the, the desire, which we, we all agree with, right? I mean, for the most part, yeah. We, you and I, you know, agree that the conceptually having remote ID is not necessarily a bad thing but it has to be implemented in such a way that it doesn't impede on the industry or commercial flights or even recreational flights even for that matter. It's, especially the FBV crowd. Oh my goodness, they're gonna be hosed if that happens. You know, it's the implementation of it was so flawed mm -hmm. uh, that there's just there was just no way that it, it was practical. And yet there's so many people who are for the concept of it and that's hard to explain to people. 
Right. Well, even as you read it, and, and this was brought up a few different times I, I talked about the RID, is as you read, those of us who had enough brain damage to actually sit down and try and read the whole thing, you could tell where two different people wrote two different paragraphs, one in front of the other, and it was just inserted with no rhyme or reason. You know, you could tell there's so many fingerprints, there's only fingers in this pie that even if they followed the letter of the NPRM, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, it was uh, it was a disaster. Yeah, <laughs> that's that. a nice way to put it. Exactly, exactly. It's a kind way to put it. Now, but you I'm, under, I'm very are, optimistic about it. I really am because they under the FAA knows if 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 it's really you know just just on, onerous and horrible, they're not going to get compliance, and without compliance, it's dead in the water. Right. Do you so, do you think something's coming uh, before the end of the year, or do you think we're still a few months out? Um, I think it is going to be released this month. Um, again, one of those things is like, please, please, please. And I think I'm, they're just going to start blocking my emails. But um, I really honestly think it will be released this month. They've been saying that since the AUVSIFA symposium. Um, Eric was on there talking about it, and he was doing the same thing. Hey, can't talk about it, but you know, look at uh, look at the look at this month, the end of the year. So I'm I would be amazed if it was not this month and I will also be would not be amazed if it was between Christmas and New Year simply because that's a, a slow news news week and so that that will actually be a the final um, thing final for it rule. instead of opening up for another yep, um, yep. it'll uh, be final rule. it's actually uh, it's actually in the executive branch right now waiting for signature or has already been signed um, because the uh, exec executive branch has to sign off on it so President Trump has to sign off on it and um, obviously, he's busy doing other things at the moment. But um, the uh, yeah, it's 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 a done deal. It's just a matter of uh, when the FAA releases it. And, and okay. I think the I think the industry interest what about if the industry uh, new the industry um, is just saying it's it's going to be this month. I think it's just a given. I'll be I'll be proven right okay. or wrong at midnight on December thirty first. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm I'm hoping for the best too. You know, yeah. I mean, I, there's. There's a lot of good that can come of it. And, um, you know, if it's implemented properly and they really listen to all the feedback, you know, uh -huh. you know well, I've we are talking assured, to government. I've been assured that they that they read every single comment. Um, some of them took three seconds to read. We need to know and I know which ones those are. And every single AMA comment got put in the same pile. So that was one of the issues with the what the hell, uh, how AMA did it. I think there were 13,000 AMA. Nah, that doesn't sound right. I can't remember now, but there were a whole bunch of different AMA people who who said the same thing because it was copy and paste. Um, and as yeah. one of my FAA friends said, it's not it's not it's 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 not an election. You're not voting for this. You're just giving us information. It's the same. You know, if everybody says the same thing, it's pointless. So I I went right. round and round with the with the AMA leadership on that. They didn't like the letter I wrote. Yeah, there there was a <laughs> lot of uh, AMA and others were saying copy and paste this. Yep. And yep. That was not the right approach. Yeah, but many of us any actually wrote our own yep. dissertation on the, the matter. And there will be um, other FAA NPRM, so I'm going to put that out there. Don't do that again. Make, yeah, write your please. stuff and tell a story about yourself. Make it personal. That's what they want to see. That's what they want to hear. How is this going to affect you, your business? Mm -hmm. Bingo. Sure. Bingo. All right. Um, now, I, I a little more off topic here, but... Uh, have you been following the one uh, where the pilot was just fined like $180,000? Yeah, 184. Mikey, Philadelphia. Um, yeah. I have been following it. I've talked with both Domo and um, Ryan. Have both talked to him about it. I haven't talked to him. I I can't stand listening to him. I just I can't, I cringe when people use that kind of language. But um, he ignored the FAA, and a really really good story. Or behind this would be that you know if if the FAA reaches out to you, don't ignore them. They're not trying <laughs> to come after your firstborn child. They want to just talk to you. And he kept ignoring them, and he kept ignoring them. So they went on his website and said, "Here's a violation. Here's a violation. Here's a violation." Oh, by the way, here's a hundred eighty-four thousand dollar proposed fine. Let's talk. Now he's talking. Um, he would have just he would have saved himself a lot of headache. If he would have just, when the first time they reached out to him, said, what? And then they would have said, hey, don't do this. This is what you need to do. That's the approach the FAA takes. They don't want to find anybody. They're not out to punish anybody. Um, their their whole thing is, is education and safety. So so listen yeah. to them. I got a letter when I was flying pre-333 days. 
I'm a certified, wait a minute, how do I, how do I say it? I'm a certified non-compliant FAA 333 operator. <laughs> I think you might have gotten one of those letters too. If I'm I've, I've been I've been approached by the FAA yep. before. Yep. yep. And it, we're all doing it was just something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it wasn't something I wanted to ignore. And mm -hmm. you know, let's let's do some education here and you know see where and they're coming it. from. Move on. Where Thank am you. I coming from? Yeah. And that's um, all I want. And with the with the 107, now there's actual rules in place as opposed to the 333 interpretation, which we won't get into. Um, and so, you know, they just say, hey, this is what you did wrong. This is what you need to do right. And if you say, oh, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, that's the end of the story. And it's just right. like a highway patrolman pulling you over on, you know, for a, let's say you've got a, a headlight out. They pull you over for a headlight or a taillight, let's say taillight. And you say, oh, I didn't know. I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. You know, they give you a warning. They say, get it fixed, go home. But if you say, ah, oh, blah, 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 don't you have anything better to do than pull somebody over for a taillight? Guess what? They're going to find every little thing wrong with your car and give you a ticket for it. Same thing. Same thing so, with the FAA. And one, one of the reasons why I wanted to go into this particular topic is mm -hmm. in looking at the, the Facebook groups and stuff and the comments around this, there is, um, there's a couple pieces to this. So kind of let me get it all together here for you. Oh, the, on, on one hand, there's people who are still confused about what constitutes a Part 107 flight. Oh, gosh. Then, um, I, I know, I know. I'll, I'll work <laughs> through this with you, right? And then whether whether that's even applicable to this particular situation. So Absolutely. When, in, in my discussions with um, our FISDO here, the way he put it was every flight is a Part 107 unless you meet this strict criteria mm -hmm. where other people tend to interpret it as being everything is recreational unless it's for profit. Bingo. And Bingo. There's, and there's a, a huge gap in the, the difference there. There really is. And, and I haven't have, a, have an article on a medium that I post links to all the time in the groups. <clears throat> it's, it is so, so simple. There's no gray area when it comes to drone flights. Like you said, by default, every single drone flight out there is a 107 flight. Now you've got the public COAs and the 333s that still exist, blah, blah, blah. We won't talk about that. But the vast majority is 107 unless it's there is the exception to the, uh, the, the rules for, exception to the rules for recreational flyers. Um, in which case you've got eight criteria that you have to satisfy in order to not be 107. And that first criteria that everybody not everybody, most people fail is 100% for recreation. If you're not flying 100% for recreation, it's a 107 flight, done, period, end of discussion. And people don't understand that. And I don't know why, it's literally black and white. So- Well, because it's it's the people who go, but I'm I'm just flying for my church. I'm flying for yeah. a nonprofit. I'm, Bingo. you know, I'm not making money. I'm, no one is benefiting from this. Well, they're not flying recreational. I'm not saying I necessarily agree with that. Don't get me wrong, but it's it's not recreational, so it's it's a 107 flight. Will the FAA care if you're out flying for your church or flying for a nonprofit? Probably not, unless you make make a habit of it. And again, yeah, the, the views expressed here are not those of the FAA. <laughs> well, in an extent, and when we're quoting them, you know, in in mm -hmm. some regards, but that's that's the big misconception is that money has to change hands absolutely or and that is that's just not true i mean yeah you think about a, a real estate agent who's flying for himself there's mm -hmm. no money changing hands right. for that it's still part 107 a farmer who's inspecting his own crops there's yep. no money exchanging hands and yet you know now there's the, the little tagline in the furtherance of a business yeah um, that's a misnomer but it's accurate yeah, and it, it's kind of the easiest way to explain it, I think, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. if I'm going out and I mean, I, I can't even think of what it would mean to me to do a recreational flight these days, maybe practicing FPV flight. That's uh, about it. For possibly, too, yep. You know, um, because I know if I'm just flying around for the hell of it, and I pick up something good, I'm using it for marketing. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. I mean, every fly. I, 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 go ahead. Yeah. It, there's, so my intent is my, my intent at the time of the flight may be just to go out and get some landscape shots, 
but I also know that I fully intend to use that as maybe stock footage uh -huh. or you know a marketing piece on that drone or something if it turns out really well. So for sure. me, it's really, really hard to say that anything is recreational with the one exception of when I'm at the park and I'm, I'm practicing FPV stuff and there, nothing's even being recorded. Yep. If, I'm, if I know for a fact, which is really hard on the Mavic 2 Pro, my go-to bird, but if I know for a fact that it's going to be a recreational flight, I don't, put a, I don't put a card in there. That way, you know, again, I can do the, do to the, so it doesn't really work with the Mavic, but with the Inspires and the, and the Phantom yeah. and that. Yeah, if there's no card in it, you're not, it's, you're not going to do anything. So, you know, if, you, if you all of a sudden something goes, oh, I want that, you got to go down, put a card in it, and now it's, a, now it's a 107 flight. All right. So to get to the question asked by Lowell, he says, was the Philly pilot a 107 pilot or a model flyer? And the, the short answer, as we've kind of said, is, well, by default, he's a part 107 pilot yep. because he's in the air. And now whether he was meeting the criteria of it being <laughs> recreational or not is another question. And he because he's flying with the intent of putting this on YouTube on a monetized channel, where do we stand on that? Well, um the FA obviously stands as 107 because they sent him $184,000 for pros. Fine. <laughs> but um, it's okay. I, I watched one of his, and like I said, I just can't stand listening to the guy. But um, one of his things was he said, go buy X. I can't remember what it was. It was some kind of drone part. And he said, mention my name. I get a little bit of revenue from that. Boom, 107. Boom. Um, yeah. He yeah. flew his Mavic Mini 3,200 feet. I think it was when he got it back. I don't know. I didn't even, I don't want to know why he had to get it back. It probably means he crashed it um, in downtown Philly. Now he lives in a 400 foot because um, it's really easy to triangulate where he lives because he lifts off from his house. It's like, hmm, I know where you live. Um, he lives in a 400 foot grid uh, from the airport. Um, in one of his things I watched, the warning came up and he said, screw that and turn the warning off and flew. And that's his 3,200 foot downtown Philly out to the river flight that he that he that he uh, live live broadcast so there were a ton of different things that he did very 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 incorrectly there um i'm not judge or jury but um yeah he he screwed up and it's his when we're, when we're trying to look at it yeah and if we look at it purely from a technical point of view or legal mm -hmm. point of view or however you want to look at it he was not meeting the criteria of it being purely recreational bingo so bang, gone. Therefore, mm -hmm. part 107, right? Yep. So um, I hope that helps to explain this to some people because it's, when I read it and I've, I've read the, the, the 107 document, you know, end to end multiple times, I didn't see any gray area. There isn't any. I, it, it seemed very, very cut and dry to me. And yet people still seem to <laughs> interpret it different ways. Yep, yep, that's what they do. Um, and 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 you know, as as humans, and this is one of the things I mentioned in the article is, as humans, we always want to simplify things. But when we finally get our wish to where it's simplified, then we go look for the ways to get around it. We look for those loopholes and that kind of stuff. And it's just you know, just just be smart, fly safe. That's all they want. Right, right. And the other thing um, he did was part three of four four eight oh nine, which is the recreational. Um, I looked it up real quick. Um, the recreational part that, that says you can fly recreational is number three, the air aircraft is flown within visual line of sight of the person operating the aircraft. You are not going to see a mini 3,200 feet away. So right yeah. there, 107. Absolutely. Uh, so Roy's asking, so you are saying that if we are flying for fun, we need to take a test. No, that, that's not what we're saying at all. Not what yet. we're saying is a, not yet, right. Um, <laughs> what we're saying is, you, if you take off, you are bound by the rules of the part 107. Now, whether you meet the criteria for that being recreational, which means you don't need a certificate, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's fine. But if you do not meet the cr criteria for it being recreational, now you are, for lack of a better word, you are flying commercially, you need to be, uh, have the certification. Yep. So, uh, the, the, official, the official part is 49 U.S. Code 
section 44809 and the title is exception for limited recreational operations of manned aircraft of unmanned aircraft sorry um, and that gives you the eight criteria that you have to fly under two of which are not quite active yet but so you have to satisfy those six um, to still fly as a hobbyist without being 107 and uh, recreational is the biggest one that people don't understand along with line of sight so yeah Stevie Stevie was uh, or uh, Mikey was was being a bad boy yeah um, so here's okay here's two I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap two questions together Perfect. here Go for it. yeah um, I'm not reading a question so, I'm gonna do that. sorry uh, one of them is uh, can you mention how charging for drone flight instruction by flying the drone is also a 107 flight and mm -hmm. can you talk about how you view educational flights for K-12 education, such as high school STEM team for drones? If the student is flying the drone outside for the school purpose, would you consider that 107? Yes, in both cases. I mean, uh, ish. Yeah. ish. Go ahead. <laughs> um, there right. is an educational exception, but it is restricted to higher education only. Um, they are working on, last I heard, they are working on trying to include um, primary, secondary, and high school educations in that, in the STEM program. I was actually with a STEM program this afternoon um, talking about, well, photography on this side. But when you're talking about the, the instructor, technically the instructor has to have a 107, and the person I'm working with actually does have his 107. Um, the child, the children. I'm sorry. The students do not have to have a 107 to fly for school. They, if they're there, because the instructor can then be the pilot in charge. But the instructor cannot have one more than one person flying at a time if they're flying in the national airspace. Um, so the student itself, himself or herself, does not have to have a 107, but they have to have a 107 with them. Um, but again, that's one of those things. If you're if you're a high school student taking a drone class and you want to go out and fly, um, it's really kind of a that might be the only real true gray area where yes, you should have your 107 because it's not only recreational, but will the FAA care? Now, if you're flying at the end of the runway at Centennial, you're dang right the FAA is going to care. But if you're in a Dugco Park somewhere where they're allowed, you know, you're allowed to fly or, or South Suburban. Um, you know, you just just fly safe, fly smart. Don't be stupid. You should be fine. Excellent. A um, couple other kind of related questions here about uh, kids getting them for Christmas. There'll be a lot of them sent, you know, sold this Christmas. How will the <laughs> recreational user know of the rules? Well, they don't. Good question. Very good uh, question. I mean, very simple. Um, That's where the drone it, throws. It's damn near impossible. Yep, it is. Uh, it's virtually impossible. I know you tried, and maybe you still do, but you had for a while. You were putting the rules in the boxes when you sold drones, and I wish all retailers. Yeah, I mean, we we try in our store here to provide the education to make sure mm -hmm. people understand what they need to know. Um, I feel it's it's you know part of our responsibility as a responsible drone seller to yep. provide that information. Um, and along those lines, Robert's asking, will manufacturers of drones be eventually required to put information in their packages regards to laws and guidelines? God, I hope so. Well, I actually, I kind of hope, well, I don't want to say I hope not, but I don't see it happening. Because let's look at DJI. Uh, I, they sell how many different countries? Yeah. And how many different um, rules? Like in the United States, how many different rules per city, per state, per county? You know, if they don't, if you buy a buy one in, in Chicago and you don't know about the Chicago rule, which is illegal, by the way, um, and you go back to DJI and said, hey, it's not, it's not in your book. That's going to open up DJI to a liability. It, it would. And yet, at the same time, I think being able to, to say you should go to FAA drone zone dot FAA dot gov, mm -hmm. you know, and you should. Here's where you should start looking for information. Right, and I, I think that's as far as I would allow, I would want them to go. Right, is here's the FAA rules. Refer to the FAA. Right, so I could yeah. see that happening, um, but it, you know, but again, then that would have to be the ones that are that are that are geared towards the United States, and I'm sure somewhere along the assembly line, you know, they, these are going to Taiwan, and these are going to Germany, and these are going to the United States. At some point, they might be able to do that, but that's a manufacturing issue. That, well, I mean, um, in in a sense, it already is because we have different power cords than other countries. That's true. That's true. So, so it's doable. It's, You're right. It's doable. I, I think it's doable. I think it would be responsible. I, I think it would be uh, beneficial to the purchaser to have awesome. mm -hmm. the It'd most great. basic level of information. Right. So. But that's not going to happen. So then it's up to us drone owners to help educate folks. 
<laughs> no. Um, okay. Uh, what about beyond visual line of sight? Uh, that is not coming down through the, uh, the uh, RID. It's going to be... Um, that is still going to be a waiverable issue because there's so many, so many, so many, so many things that um, have to take place for a safe operation of BV loss. Now, will it be relaxed? Maybe because we, let's say we're just talking about the mini. You know, for me, BV loss at, at you know for a mini is you know 75 feet because I can't see. <laughs> but you know, that's, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But um, you know, my my Mavic um, when I've got my VO with me, uh, well, not when I almost always have my VO with me, uh, Todd. He his job is to watch the Mavic because I can't see it. I'm looking down and I'm composing the shot, um, and I can't see it. So he has to tell me where to look up. And a lot of the time, yeah, I know where it is in the sky, but I can't see it because my eyes have been focusing back and forth. And but he knows exactly where it is. So I would like to see something along the lines of, hey, you know, if you can see the airspace you're in, and you can safely understand that that's fine, then yeah, you know, you can still do that. I wish they'd change the definition. Does that mean that you can see the airspace a mile and a half away and you can still fly there? No, I don't think so. I think that's still dangerous. But where 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 yeah. is that where is that line? I don't know. But it's not part, of, it's not, I don't think it's gonna be part of the new rules. I'd be amazed because it wasn't part of the NPRM. Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree with you on that. So let's get to the the biggie, the big news uh recently about changes to uh let's just paraphrase it the chinese drone ban yeah the uh unfriendly skies drone, whatever it's called yeah uh in the yeah. national defense authorization act um the house ver oh i'm gonna find i might get this backwards but i think the house version had the country of origin ban so the unfriendlies as it were which basically everybody knows it was a dji ban um you know, and Autel too, obviously, for the most part. But it's it was in the House bill and it wasn't in the Senate version of the bill. So when there's differences in every single bill, it goes to the conference committee and the conference committee chose not to include that clause into the National Defense, uh, the, the National Defense Authorization Act. So that is not part of that, um, which is a huge victory for the drones, uh, drone world, whether you're pro DJI, anti DJI, pro Autel, whatever, um, it's a huge victory because of the way it was worded, it would have just devastated the search and rescue crowd. Um, that doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet, but for the most part, this was a huge victory. Everything else is on, that's been on the board and been proposed is, is either sitting in committee um, or in the case of the executive order, um, that was just threatened and never followed through. And I just, I seriously so, doubt well, it's anywhere on his radar. What, right what does this mean? This means that we're not gonna have to worry, well, not we in particular, but, um, companies and entities that use federal funds, whether it be DOI, whether it would be the uh, Jefferson County Sheriff's Department or the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, LAPD, whoever, use federal funds to um, help grow or build or even start their drone programs could not use any of the money they get for anything outside of the approved vendors, which would be American made, um, the parrots, uh, those kind of things that basically aren't Chinese or Korean, North Korean, which I don't think we're going to buy any North Korean drones. They can't even get a rocket to go up. But um, so any, any, you know, that was what it was for. And so it's, it's just going to be a huge boon to the, um, to the industry. And it wasn't just drone pilots actually that, that rode into the Senate uh, to the, uh, to their legislators and said, Hey, this is, this doesn't work for us. I wrote in, I know you wrote in, uh, I know a, few, a bunch of other drone pilots wrote in, it was um, API, which is the American Petroleum Institute, wrote in and said, this is not a good idea. It was the US Chamber of Commerce and Association of American Universities. All these different entities kind of got together and said, this is a really horrible idea and this is why. So obviously it worked in the Senate, not so much in the House, um, but it was, it was enough, it had enough traction once it got to the conference committee that they got together and said, yeah, this is a bad idea. We're not gonna include it in the, um, in the final uh, final um, bill. So it was great. It was a, it was a great victory for us. Um, we won the battle, I would say, but we still might lose a skirmish or two. So we still have to keep our eyes open for that. Right. I, I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, great explanation too, Vic. Really appreciate that. For a lot of our fire departments, police departments, search and rescue teams, sheriff departments, uh, that's a, 
that's one of my core businesses is exactly. going to public safety. Mm-hmm. And for them not to be able to purchase the product that they wanted to do their job, or they just wouldn't be able to get a grant. Bingo. Uh, and Bingo. that was that was the killer. The right. grants that were coming in were saying you cannot use sometimes specifically DJI products. Sure. Other times it was, you know, uh, now that we have the new blue line uh, uh, rules for these approved products that mm-hmm. you have to buy these blue line products. And what you would end up with is a, a drone that was far below the minimum specifications that you needed to do the job at a price that was three or four times higher than what you really wanted to get in the first place. And so you, the, the only the only people who were moving through with these grants were ending up with overpriced priced products that underdelivered versus that, a DJI exactly. product that worked. Exactly. Well, even an Autel. I mean, Autel puts out some nice birds as well. But yes, um, they it's it would have been the way it was worded if you read it. Um, there are components that you would not have been allowed to use, which would have probably Um, You know, I haven't really dug into it too deep because I I have other things to do. Um, It would have done things like kick Skydio out. It would have done things like kick Parrot out because there are components on that list that they would still be using that come from China. Let's just say, you know, let's just it's a Chinese drone ban. Let's just call it let's just call it what it is Um, that come from those 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 entities that are part of the American made or the French made or whatever made drones, uh, including the Autel ones made here in the United States. (laughs) <laughs> they would have said, no, oh, can't use it. Sorry. Because it has those components. So made in the USA doesn't mean it would be a perfectly safe drone. I mean, by their definition. Well, because like Autel, their their certification that they got is made in the USA with foreign and domestic components. Bingo. And yet it still qualifies for Blue Line, <laughs> which I, it, it makes no sense. Um, it, it, it was but, politi- it was political, and it was it was really pushed hard by people out an axe to grind, a personal axe to grind with DJI, yeah. and that was that was why it was what it was. Um, we all know who those well, not all of us. Some of us know who those people are, and they were they were spurned early in this in this in this thing by DJI because of their actions, and they decided they took it personal. And it it went pretty damn far. It did. Yeah. It did. Uh huh. You know, and the anti-Chinese thing right now is real popular in D.C. too, so that didn't help. Yeah. Um, Michael's asking, when might we expect to see some of these restrictions lifted? Uh, months? Year? What restrictions are you uh, talking about? Well, I'm, I'm, I believe he's talking about the this drone ban. And oh, there is no drone ban, so don't worry about it. Now, you've still got DOD, you've got DOI, Coast Guard, which is under DHS. Um, those are still... In there, you know, I think it's called a COTS, C-O-T-S. I don't remember exactly what it stands for, but the DOD has their COTS. So you can't fly, like I can't fly at the Air Force Academy. I lost a huge job because I couldn't fly at the Air Force Academy. But now somebody else flew at the Air Force Academy football game using an Inspire. So there's ways around the rules. Um, and I lost a DOI job because I couldn't fly my my um, um, DJI at the Rocky Flats Nuclear Power Area or the Rocky Flats uh, um, Wildlife Preserve. So it's 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 the restrictions will have to come down uh, be relaxed at the department or the uh, agency level at this point um they're not really going to be the federal level is going to be an issue it's it's just going to be down to the agency or the um um that level it's not going to be a national level all right um stacy's asking is the chinese ban retroactive will agency drones have to be sold off now this is the exact opposite stacy so where some people were already taking this ban into play when it came to purchases and grants. There is no ban now. Right. Um, now there's at, the at DOI. Different level. Yeah, DOD, DOI. DOI had, they, DOI grounded their whole fleet. Uh, I think they had 1,200 or 1,000 DJI drones that they grounded, um, which hurt fire season, um, which hurt mitigation, all kinds of different things. But we won't go into that. Um, now, will they have to sell them? No, it's going to be an executive order um, at the at the at the level at the agency level that will hopefully rescind that. But now the problem is they've had all these DJI drones sitting for a year. What are their batteries like? You know, this yeah. has ended up costing them money. 
they're going to put something if they, in the if they weren't properly maintained yep it's it's bad yeah. i mean let's say they put a put a put one of their phantoms up and doing a mapping in a dry area of rocky flats let's use rocky flats again um and all of a sudden it quits because the battery wasn't maintained well and it lands on a rock and busts the lipo shell what's going to happen to rocky flats now <laughs> yeah. are all those animals in the animal preserve going to get baked um it's it was it was dumb to begin with and i hope and i not even hope i know that once it is lifted if it is list, lifted they'll do their due diligence before they put everything back in the air yeah and you know michael's saying he they presently have federal grants for which they're not permitted to use funds for purchase of chinese drones and whether you're going to have to resubmit for that grant or whether there can be an addendum to it or what i i mean i'm i'm not a grant expert to be able that to would be that yeah have your lawyers talk to their lawyers <laughs> yeah that's what it's going to take uh, where was the cut there was a couple other good ones do you see the faa redefining navigable airspace to in, exclude lower altitudes i don't see the faa doing it but i i i would be and this is something i've thought for a while at some point we're not going to be able to rely on the manned aviation cases, whether it's, you know, Cirolo, Cirolo versus Florida or Riley versus, I'm sorry, Cirolo versus California, Riley versus Florida. Those are all based on manned aviation. Um, I think it's probably going to take a court case that is UAS specific that will define navigable airspace. Now, what that looks like, I have no idea. This, again, is just speculation. But I think at some point we're going to see a case that go all the way to the Supreme Court It'll have to, or else it'll be so disjointed in all the different jurisdictions. Um, it'll have to go to the Supreme Court and say, okay, you have as a landowner 50 feet, whatever. I mean, blah, 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 you know, whatever that magic number is. Um, it would not surprise me if that ends up within the next few years. Yeah, it's not going to be quick. No, absolutely not, because nothing, nothing gets to the Supreme Court tomorrow. Yeah. And I don't know of any cases right now that would, that would <clears throat> alleviate to that. That doesn't mean they're not out there. It just means I don't know them. You know, somebody sued somebody because of now privacy laws and things like that. Who knows? You know, you've got the the uh, ULC, so the Unified Law Commission. What we thought that may be resurrected. We don't know. Um, this is actually this is kind of a funny one. <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen it. Any further word regarding the Shelley Luther ad in Texas? <laughs> We're not going there. Um, <laughs> the, the word I have is, and for those of you who don't know, it's there's a, a, a a congressperson, I think. Anyway, uh, somebody who's running for office shot a drone down over her house. It was her own drone. It's probably not on a video in her team. ad. Yeah, on, on video in her ad and put it on Facebook. Um, it's probably it's questionable whether or not it's a violation of 18 U.S.C. 32 because it's her own drone. Um, but it's a lot of people have reached out to her to try and get her to realize that it was really a bad idea. Um, I reached out to her on Twitter, email, and Facebook, and she ended up banning me from her Facebook pages. Um, I was just, I just wanted to have a nice cordial conversation with her. I even said that. Um, I know AUVSI Texas is uh, reaching out to her. FAA knows about it. DOJ knows about it. Um, but, you know, it's just, it's just best if it dies down um, and let it, let it go away. But she, she is, yeah, it needs to go away. <laughs> it needs to go away. Um, it, it all it all blew up today. That was part of my day today. Was dealing with that. Yeah, that was that one was actually kind of funny. It uh, was funny. It was funny. And I and I, I'm for those of you who don't know me, I'm a pretty far right guy, you know, um, politically. But that was just it was just way beyond the pale for me. It's like no 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 no. You've crossed a line, sweetheart. She's from Texas. We can call her sweetheart. I, yeah, they understand I, that. <laughs> I think my my initial comment to her was, "Good job breaking a federal law." and posting it online yeah Excellent. pretty much pretty um, much so we'll see so, where it goes uh, i've been reached out to by the AUVSI chapter there and they're going to reach out to her and they actually already know her and that she knows them so they're going to they're going to use it as an educational opportunity <laughs> i'd like to educate her <laughs> <laughs> i'm just going to sit here and bite my tongue okay uh one last one from lowell um yeah this is this is a great question lowell actually how difficult it is to get a waiver to fly within class D airspace. And the, the short answer to that is, well, if you actually need one, it shouldn't be that hard, but in most cases, you're gonna use lands. Um, well, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put my, uh, my um, uh, grammar Nazi hat on for a minute. It's not a waiver. Mm -hmm. 
If you try to get a waiver in Class D airspace, you will not get it and you'll get rejected. It's going to take you 12 months to get a rejection. What you're looking for is authorization. Um, big difference, and the FAA get this interchanged all the time too, um, but it is an authorization, not a waiver. And that's a big deal because when you go to apply for either a 10741 authorization through a drone zone, you want to apply for an authorization, not a waiver. It's not real. Um, although I haven't really checked the new system yet, how different that is. But authorization. If it's Lance, get Lance. You know, Lance is low low area, low low altitude authorization. <laughs> I don't know what it's called. I can never remember. But it's the you know it's the automatic approval through um, Kitty Hawk through Skyward. Um, there's a new one out there now through from Boeing. I just got to, which is kind of interesting to see. I think it came out yesterday, day for yesterday. Um, don't use uh, don't use AirMap. Um, but um, it's you do that if it's a Lance Active Airport, and you can do that by going on the uh, um, the FAA ArcGIS site, ARCGIS, and it's a typical federal website. So it's FAA.ArcGIS.gov, something like that, with 1,400 letters numbers behind it. So the best thing to do is Google FAA. Um, visualize it, and it'll take you right to it. So visualize it, FAA, is what you want to do. And then, then bookmark it. Every single drone, every single computer I have is bookmarked with uh, with the uh, the Visualize It site. If it's red, you have to apply for a um, 10741 wide area authorization. And it usually takes, depending on the airport, a week to two weeks, three weeks. But if it is Lance and you want to fly under the maximum flight in the uh, in the uh, uh, grid map, so you've got an AGL, you've got a 100 foot or 200, 400 foot grid, 50 foot grid, whatever. If you want to fly underneath that, you just go to Lance, get an authorization, use an app, get an authorization, go fly. No worries. Um, if you want to fly above that, then you have to apply for. You can still apply through Lance, which is a little more difficult, or get a 107 uh, 41 authorization uh, that way. I mean, we can kind of get into the whole, you know nuances of that but that's that's a webinar in and of itself but it's not that I'll hard. say yeah and that's that's why I thought it was interesting to bring up because um, if your airport does not participate in Lance then go to FAA dronezone.fa.gov and mm -hmm. you can apply right there it, Neither it's as really a, not as a 107 ahead. or hobbyist recreational flyer I'm sorry they're not hobbyists they're recreational flyers um, <laughs> both of those you can you can apply for one of those either way and uh, uh, recreational flyers can also use Lance. It is not a uh, 107 specific system. Oh, and you stirred it up, Vic. Uh oh. Several questions. Let me, let me say something real quick, though. Um, if you need to fly, like, you know, as a 107 pilot, we've got that 400 foot bubble. That doesn't work in Lance. That doesn't work in the in the UAS FMs. Okay. If it's a 200 foot grid, it's a 200 foot grid. If you've got a 250 foot building there, you can't fly the final 50 feet. So, sorry, I had to right. put that out there just so, just for. No, no, good clarification there. Um, a couple stir? people now have asked, <laughs> why not AirMap? We're not going there. Let's just say they're not, they're not, they're not friendly to the community. There's plenty of stuff Best online. People it. can find it. They're not, they're not friendly to the community. Yeah. Um, good enough uh, to me anyway, because <laughs> I understand. How would a first responder get permission to fly in Class E airspace at night without a COA? The Depends first on responder which... already has a daylight waiver, but Lance does not work with the waiver. So the only option airspace waivers through drone zone? No, not airspace waiver. Um... It depends on which E. Now, if you're talking about something like Loveland here locally, that's called E2, which is E on the airport. If you're talking about an extension like they have at Centennial here locally, where it's it's an extension of D or an extension of C, then that is that is same class. That's not same classification, but it's handled the same way as as G airspace. So if it's E2 at the airport, so you're flying on airport property then you need to get an authorization. And what you would do in a situation like that, a first responder could probably get an ECOA, they'd have to go through FISDO to do that, uh, or at least FISDO would help them help them jump all those hoops because there are not that many hoops. Um, but what they should do is apply for a 10741 airspace wide area authorization, airspace wide area authorization and attach their 10729 waiver to it. It's super simple. I've got 40 of them um, across the states here in the Western United States. 
and uh, you just you attach it when you apply for your waiver authorization in the drone zone. So it's, uh, just attach your daylight waiver to it. Super simple. Um, I'm probably going to be doing another video on that since they changed the drone zone. I did one a while ago, um, but um, uh, I need to put one together like that and get it out there. But it is super simple. Um, so Richard Purcell is asking about advice on getting authorization in a zero grid. <laughs> and first off, that's going to depend on the airport. So 100%. Vic, Vic has been yes. in zero grid at DIA. <laughs> I am in zero grid at DIA I'm, every month. I'm 150 feet away from zero grid of Centennial Regional Airport, and they will not grant permission. So nope. here, nope. Vic has got, air, he's flown in zero grid at one of the busiest airports in the entire country, and I can't fly in zero grid at a regional that's a block away from my office. Yep. So I actually got the first zero grid commercial flight for DFW. And actually, I wouldn't say first zero grid, but we flew on the tarmac. We had to yeah. land. We had to. We couldn't take off because the UPS plane was taxiing down, and we would hit it. <laughs> um, so it's it's yeah. Centennial just between you. Well, not between you and me and the fence host, because I'm gonna say it here right now. Centennial has a new new um, tower manager, and my contact out there has not had a chance to talk to him yet. So we'll see if that changes. Um, okay. So getting getting a zero grid back to the question, it's really 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 dependent on airports oh, and the best Vic? thing. To do, yeah. Vic, let's yeah. define what zero grid means. Oh, I'm sorry. When you look at the UASFM, so you've got the grid map. Every airport out there has one, including DODs, airports, except for the G airports. They don't have them, don't need them. And those are the uncontrolled airports in G airspace, um, untowered, the whole nine yards. Um, you, every, every one of them put together about three years ago what's called the UASFM, which is the Unmanned Aircraft System Facility Map. We also call it the grid map. If you look at it, everything's put up in, I think it's one second grids. Um, and every single one of those grids has a maximum altitude you're allowed to fly in without further coordination. So if it's 50 foot, then you can fly 50 foot there. You just get permission and you call it happy. But if it's a zero grid, meaning you cannot fly there at all, then it takes a couple extra steps. So that's the zero grid. Um, and every single one is so airport specific. Uh, what I tell everybody who asks me this question is you reach out to the airport. Um, to ask to talk to the either the UASFM, no, I'm sorry, the UAS POC, which is the point of contact, or the air uh, the air traffic control manager, um, either email or phone. And the first thing you want to say to them is, I am not asking for permission, but this is what I want to do. What safety mitigations do you want to see in the application? I will do my application via Lance. Can I let you know when it's coming? A lot of times airports will use the uh, man, it's called manual authorization when you have to go above and beyond those those uh, those grid maximums. Um, those go to the airport, and some airports ignore those as a way to not authorize the flight. So the FAA UAS office is not fond of that method and have reached out to a number of airports that do that. Um, because they understand that if they're not working with zero grid, you know, if they're not working with pilots who are qualified to fly in a zero grid, then some pilots, not all of them, definitely not me or you, uh, will fly there anyway because they know it's safe and, and they won't know anybody is there. Um, you know, the ATC won't know it's there. So it's basically reach out to the airport and say, this is what I want to do. What safety mitigations would you like to see in my Lance authorization? Okay. Um... <laughs> so, yeah, a long answer as, to short question, sorry. Right. And if you if you just look up facility map or like your airport facility map, you'll find it. Yep. So in my case, my office is in 150 grid from Centennial Airport. Mm -hmm. And if I go across the street, <laughs> I'm in zero grid. So yep. I am right on the freaking border. So I have to be very careful about not flying out to my street. Otherwise, I would end up in zero grid. But where I'm at, I'm in 150 grid. If I go further away from the airport, I'll, I'll go up to 200 grid and then 400 grid and, and so on. So um, it's, it's really not, it's, it's pretty cut and dry when you look at a facility map. You yeah, go, here's yeah, yeah. where I'm at, there's a square, that's, that's my grid. Yep. yep. Um, so we kind of got away from news uh, and updates <laughs> and yeah, we're getting into some just what I do. open QA here. So it's kind of fun. Um, uh, let's, 
uh, I, I kind of lost track of where we were here. When a oh, tower a is closed, time. like after 9 p.m., and I mm -hmm. have a 10729 and want to fly near the airport, is that okay? Depends on the airport. Well, depends on the airport. <laughs> Some revert to G, right? Some do. And Some, not all. Uh, Some do. Not all. So it, it's definitely going to depend on the, the airspace when that tower is closed, and you can look that up on the sectional maps. Yeah, you can. Um, or the, um, oh, I just had it. There's a FAA website. Um, Crud, it's all the inf it's all the airport information. I anyway, know, I know. The, uh, it yeah, I think it's something like facility the facility uh, directory. Facility directory. Um, look that up. Now, one of the issues with looking it up is everything is in Zulu time. So you got to learn how to convert that. And don't ask me now because I forget every single time. <laughs> so just because it says 0330 Z doesn't mean it's 330 in the morning. You got to figure out what local time is compared to Zulu time. Um, good point. Excellent point. Um, just to... But if it's G, you can fly. If it, if it reverts to E, that means it's probably E2, then you need permission. Yeah. Oh, he, he's saying, uh, AJ saying, I just took my recurrent. And the questions made it clear that flying around a tall structure would allow you to fly in controlled airspace. Uh -huh. Well, the facility map is the facility map. If this says 150 grid, right? it's 150 grid, not 150 feet above a 100-foot building. Right. That is set maximum altitudes from ground level, right. not above structures. Now, if we get away from the facility map area and we're and it's a 600 foot building, we can fly 400 feet above it as long as we're within 400 feet of it. And I so think I know what he's talking about though, it's slightly, slightly different than that. Um, go ahead. You can run in controlled airspace. And this is a question that Kevin actually had on one of his FAA webinars, which if you, if you have any confusion to look up Kevin Morris, the FAA webinars, he does a great, he does a great FAA webinar thing. Um, in this specific, there's some class E, let's go back to the E extensions again, that start at 700 feet. Now you are technically in controlled airspace at that point because it is E, but not E from the surface. And if you're inspecting a tower that's that's 800 feet, then you can go um, A plus force 1200 feet into E airspace. Now you have to be careful, obviously. Um, but in that particular instance, you are allowed to fly in controlled airspace above 400 feet but you're in that 400 foot bubble, but you're not under the UASFM grids. You're not under those maximums. So that's the, and, and I, I know exactly which question that is. I think I've had it on all three of my tests. Um, that, yeah, that's in that situation, you're allowed to control both. If you're in the, if you're in the, in the controlled airspace, D, B, uh, C, E2, those grids are max. I mean, that's it. You can't go above that without more, without extra permission. Yeah. Um... Where was this one? I, I did want to address this. Uh, asked is the before you fly app okay to use? And the the short answer, or maybe it's even the long answer, that is not really. I mean, it well, is basically identical to Kitty Hawk. And before you fly does not allow you to submit for Lance authorizations. Right. But Kitty Hawk is a good app now. It used to be a mess. I mean, I would have FAA people cover their cover their FAA, you know, name tags at different conventions. They don't use don't use before you fly. Um, but they gave it to Kitty Hawk, and Josh and company did a pretty decent job with putting it together. Um, uh, we had uh, one of the upper echelon there in the U.S. office. Um, we were on a panel in New York, and they mentioned somebody mentioned something about it. And he said, "No, it's actually I mentioned it. Come to think of it, he goes, no, that is the go-to." You know, the, the before you fly app is the go-to app for federal regulation. And then you can check if you're not in, in one of those areas that you need Lance authorization, you go fly. But if you are in one of those areas of Lance authorization, then you then it directs you to Kitty Hawk, which is why Kitty Hawk said, yeah, we'll work on it for you because it, it, it feeds them business. Right, but, but if it you is, just start with good Kitty app. Hawk, you have the same yeah. information. Yeah, pretty much, except so. Kitty Hawk may not have some of the TFRs. Uh, the you know that kind of stuff, or some of the uh, um, you know the the different different things that come back the FA put out about flights, um, you know especially you know during fire season those temporary TFRs, it's going to show up on before you fly first. That is as as I was told the official FAA app. Okay. So if it says well, don't there fly, you have don't it. Fly. Yeah. So 
Um, and it's not I, just I use Kitty Hawk myself for everything, but before you fly, uh, because it was redone by Kitty Hawk, is mm -hmm. a, a great little app. I just yep. wish they would add Lance to it, but you know, it hands <laughs> well, off to Kitty Hawk, so yep. no big that's, deal. That's the Lance part. That's the Lance part. Yep, exactly. And I don't really use any Lance because I have so many stinking or 104741s that I don't need it. Well, boy, that was an hour and 15 minutes that went by extremely quickly, Vic. Oh, 45 minutes. We started at three, didn't we? We started at two? Two thirty. Oh, Holy crap. Wow, yeah. this goes so fast. We have been going for a People while. With us um, too. It's amazing. I, I guess I we're just going to need to do a <laughs> uh, a Q and A uh, webinar coming up yeah. soon. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. And I love doing that stuff. Yeah, because uh, this has been great. I uh, I've really enjoyed it. I hope this was good for everybody. We had a ton of attendees today. A mm -hmm. lot of great questions. I mean, just phenomenal questions from you guys. Really appreciate that. And, and Vic, again. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day today. Sure. Um, I know you were super busy today and you were able to work this in and you know, we wait. That's why we didn't have slides. We didn't have, you know, video, our hair isn't done or whatever. Well, yeah, mine's but, done, you know, that was my camera we, already today. Come on. we just, we just wanted to get some information out about the latest uh, happenings with remote ID and the drone ban and the other things that we talked about. So um, um, yeah. Thank you guys for joining in again. I do want to plug the SBA though first. You, you go right in. Oh, yes. <laughs> God, go ahead. Yes, so, please. So many of you already know this and many of you know Kenji Sugihara. Um, he and I, he came to me earlier this summer after I um, ended up with a little more time on my hands after I got out of a, uh, another issue. Um, and uh, he reached out to me and said, hey, let's start a, a drone service provider alliance is what we ended up calling it, but just some kind of advocacy group. And um, at first I told him no, because I really didn't want another, um, I didn't want another anything else on my plate at the time. Um, but then I thought about it for a day and got back in touch with him and said, let's do it. So it took us a little while to get it up and running, but we have what's called a Drone Service Provider Alliance. It's dspalliance.org. And what we're really hoping to do is become the voice for the small and medium format drone service providers in Washington. Uh, at the local level, we have uh, we have ways that you can work with your local legislators, uh, especially some of the the, the town people. Um, but what we did is it's, it's we're volunteering. It's a volunteer right now uh, time for us, and um, it's membership of like I think it's five for students, twenty for regular, um, and a hundred dollars for certain tiers, and then it goes up from there per month. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have. Um, that will be used to do things like if Kenji or I end up on the DAC because we both applied for that drone advisory committee, um, then that will be used to cover our expenses to do things like that and um, be able to do things uh, whether, you know, with ASTM, um, Kenji's part of ASTM, we want to join UAST, which is the Unmanned Aircraft Safety Team, uh, sort of an FAA quasi-private uh, organization. USTM is the... Uh, Standards, S stands for standards. I can't remember what the rest of it is, but it's, or ASTM, I mean. Um, it sets the standards for certain aspects of drone in, their, in one of their groups, anyway, of drones uh, nationally and internationally. And so Kenji and I kind of have pooled our resources as far as our knowledge and our contacts and stuff like that and uh, put this out there. And we're really hoping that um, we get a lot of people signing up. I think it's going to work out real well for us. And uh, we are so underrepresented at the level, at the federal level as small drone service providers that it's scary. It's just the big names there now. And we we would obviously love your support, everybody. Um, and we're gonna have a great uh, board that we're gonna be announcing pretty soon, an advisory board. And we're gonna be just 100% transparent with what we're doing, um, where the money goes. It's, you know, you're entrusting us with your hard earned money. And uh, we wanna make sure that you um, are happy with what we do with it. Uh, kind of like it's a, I was kind of joking with, with Kenji. It's like, well, it's sort of like public service television, except for $20 a month, we're not going to give you a tote bag. So um, dspalliance.org, you can take a look. Um, if you have any questions, Kenji and I, our emails are right there. And uh, we'd love to answer any questions you might have. And we'd love any support you guys might give us, obviously. Thank you, Vic. This has been something that I think a lot of us have needed mm -hmm. and really, really important that there is a stronger voice of the industry out there. And right. I, I definitely have a tremendous amount of confidence in you uh, putting this together. Um, it's just because you and I have worked together so many times, um, 
yeah, I, I think this is a great that. opportunity. Yep, Kenji is 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 me on steroids. It's he's his contacts are incredible. He CCs me in some of the emails he sends out to some people. I'm like, holy crap, you have his email address, um, and then he gets an answer, which is even more which is even more amazing. Um, so I think yeah, between the two of us, um, I really think we're in a good position to to help this industry grow, especially for the small and medium sized um, drone service providers. All right, links and all that stuff will be sent out to you awesome. via email. Um, so uh, any links that you want to share, Vic, um, just send them over to me. Sure. Um, tomorrow I'll, I'll have this recording up online for everyone to, to watch. And then um, I'll send out an email to everybody that registered with that information as well. So let's wrap it up. Thanks, Vic, really appreciate it as and always. Um, just a great, great, great questions. All right. We'll catch you guys all later. Bye-bye. Have a good one, guys. Bye.